everybody. <laughs> uh, there's only one problem here. Uh, you came here to take a class on uh, native food plants, and uh, this isn't this isn't a native animal. What's going on? Also, I can't drink my wine in this thing, so this is coming off. <sighs> you wearing your hat in there? Yeah, I was wearing my hat in there. <laughs> All righty. Um, we're just wait. I, I'm gonna you know wait a minute just for a few people to come on. Sometimes people are a little late to class, always. Um, but hello, you two people that are here right now. Um, the class we're taking today is on native food plants of Baja, Arizona, and um, by Baja, Arizona, we mean Southern Arizona. And um, the reason we like to say Baja, Arizona is uh, a lot of the other terms sort of leave things out. So if we said the Sonoran Desert, uh, we might be leaving out plants native to the grasslands or the mountains. Um, and, uh, you know, so we, we like Baja, Arizona. It's more succinct than Southern Arizona too because it represents the best part of Arizona, the Gadsden Purchase part of Arizona, the part of Arizona that uh, where the people who live here live here because of the border, not despite. Um, I hope everybody has their wine or whatever they're drinking. Um, we're drinking our usual, which is kind of our, our cheap, this is our cheap wine we get from uh, the co-op. It's like, what is this, eight bucks? Yup. Eight bucks, and it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a liter. So it's a little bit more. It's a, that's, that's when we're not drinking local wine. Um, but, uh, hi, how's everyone doing? It's been beautiful weather out, right? Like every time I go outside, I just think like, I just imagine like I'm gonna, uh, there's gonna be sand and I'm gonna be on the beach, right? Is that what you're thinking? Is that what you're, th no? What? <laughs> Are you not thinking that? I'm not thinking. You're not thinking at My all. My brain is. We're a little fried cause like we, our job is outside and um, we have to hustle all week long and it's hot out. Um, anyway, you came here to uh, take a class, not watch us talk about nothing. So let's get started on that. Those of you who just joined in missed the sloth mask. Maybe it'll show up again. Um, so uh, I'm going to do this a little differently than I did last week with, with a little bit of a different um, format. So just hold on one second. That's going to look a little weird, but just bear with me. There we are. And uh, I'm going to look on here and just let me know if that looks okay in there and we can get started. Yeah. Okay. So um, this is a subject dear to my heart because um, I am, uh, I came here to study botany and one, I, I worked with a man named Richard Felger, famous botanist, um, as famous as a botanist can get anyway. And uh, one of the biggest and first, one of the first and biggest projects that I worked on was um, a, a history of the use of plants in the Sonor Sonoran Desert proper, as described by Shreven Wiggins, uh, or by the uh, the flora of Shreven Wiggins, um, and um, that was all uses, everything from food to um, to uh, you know flossing your teeth or, or picking your teeth with the bark you know of a plant or whatever. Uh, medicinal uses and everything and it was the history of those uses um, but of course uh, as I lived here longer and longer and as some of you who've taken classes from me know uh, I, I sort of accidentally became a, a nut for food and so uh, that's taken an emphasis in in my life and of course as Katie and I came together we both obsess on food and um, and so uh, na and native, the native foods of this region are very unique. Um, so some of you might not know, or some of you know, maybe, but uh, the, um, there's a designation called the UNESCO City of Gastronomy. UNESCO is the United Nations Educational, Scientific, and Cultural Organization. Um, and basically, they, they, they've, they have some topics that they um, uh, 
give recognition to cities about. One of them is food, um, and that recognition is called the City of Gastronomy. We were the, we were the first U.S. city to get that, and uh, we were actually part of pushing for that um, back when we were doing Edible Magazine. And um, so on, on uh, December 15th in 2016, we got it. And so what does that mean? Why did we get this UNESCO City of Gastronomy? Um, it's not about restaurants. Restaurants are part of the story. But it's, um, there's a lot of cities with amazing, maybe even more amazing restaurants than we have. Um, I mean, I'm partial to our cuisine here, but uh, you know, there's some there's some cities that have some pretty amazing restaurants. Why did Tucson become the first city of gastronomy in the U.S.? Um, and the answer lies in the fact that um, we live in a very unique region. It comes, it goes back to the plants. It goes back to biology, and um, our region is one of the most diverse regions in the um, country. Um, it, we have the third most diverse flora in the country and the third uh, most diversity in birds. We have the number one diversity in species of bees. Um, so the, the diversity is here. And whenever you have diversity, of course, you have a diversity of um, food because uh, there's just more species. Um, so, but it's, it was more than that too. It was more than our, our species diversity. It was also about um, our history. So um, we have a huge, con we have a, a lot of contributions towards our regional cuisine here. Um, the most important of those is the, the, the um, contributions from the indigenous cultures, the people who were here before us. Um, they didn't have the um, crops of the invaders <laughs> before the invaders got here. So they entirely relied on our native flora and they made really amazing food from it. Um, there's sort of a prejudice uh, by a lot of people who think that before Europeans got here that somehow um, the indigenous people, you know, was feast and famine or something like that. But no, they lived very well with the land and they uh, made amazing cuisine and, um, you know, different than what, how we lived, but, uh, they knew how to, um, elicit nutrition out of their land and do it in a way that was a lot more sustainable than what we do even today. So, so the, the most important contributors to our tradition is definitely the indigenous cultures. Um, but we do have other influences in our regional cuisine, the Spanish traditions, um, because Spanish were here before the, the English were here. Um, and obviously the Anglo traditions um, influence our regional tradition. And, uh, you know, a lot of you might might be surprised that the Chinese have a huge influence in our, our cuisine. Um, a lot of that is because when the railroads were built, uh, the Chinese came. And then when they settled here, they, um, hey, shut up! <laughs> That's my dog. Um we, uh, when the Chinese settled, they became our farmers and our um, market, uh, our food market people. So, um, so, and they had, they had a, a very, um, uh, uh, they had an influence in our cuisine that is not as obvious um, because they, they sort of um, kept their traditions to themselves, but it influenced our, they, they, a lot of people say the chimichanga is, is a, uh, an influence by the Chinese that is just an egg roll, uh, a Mexican egg roll. But anyway, uh, Chinese did influence us. Um, and then even now we're getting more um, immigrants from all over the world. If you know about Ish Kashida, um, Ish Kashida is a group that, um, that works with refugees. And instead of, uh, you know, having this authoritarian attitude towards refugees and telling them how to, um, learn how to be more like us, Ishkashida is way cooler than that. Ishkashida actually values their knowledge and um, works with them to, um, they find, you know, food that's being wasted in, in Arizona and um, things like, let's say, someone has a fig or a fig tree and they're not using all the figs, Ishkashida will collect all those figs and um, make use of them. And those people come from Africa and the Middle East and um I've learned so much from them. Uh, you know, I didn't even know there was such a thing as 
date vinegar. Um, but, uh, you know, that's one of the things I learned from those guys is that, you know, when they were collecting dates um, from somewhere in Tucson uh, and, and trying to preserve those foods, um, they, uh, they made this date vinegar. Pretty cool. Um, obviously, modern gastronomical science is having an influence, especially now and with our food um, um, industry that's happening now. Um, one thing that, that also influences our food traditions is our year-round growing season. And that's something people don't think about a lot. But um, the oldest site uh, known for agriculture in the entire United States, so the, 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 the earliest evidence of agriculture in all the U.S. is in Tucson at the base of A Mountain. And that's kind of amazing when you think about it because we live in a desert, right? And, um, I mean, the Sonoran Desert is the richest and the most diverse desert in the world, but, um, but uh, you know, people lived at the base of A Mountain and are near, near A Mountain there, and we're farming along the Santa Cruz River, which ran year-round in those days, but, um, but we could grow stuff year-round. And so that has a huge influence on us as well. Um, and that's all, of course, regional plant diversity we've talked about. That's like uh, pretty important too. Mm -hmm. So um, many of you are interested in this subject, but probably for different reasons. You might be into learning how to survive out in the desert and just know your native food plants. You might be a flavor addict. This probably is, I fall into all these categories, but this is probably my biggest category. I like to taste new things and, and explore with new ingredients. And so some of you might be interested in that. Um, this is also important to me too, um, but uh, we need to um, think about the future and a lot of our native plants will probably be crops that we're going to rely on during our arid future. The, the planet's warming and uh, and becoming more arid, and so people, people are doing a lot of research. This is actually a picture of, um, I think that's Janos' son. Um, oh, Ben. Yeah, that's Ben, ben Wilder, and that is a, um, a salt grass that grows at the base of the Colorado River um, that they're looking at as a food. It was a food, actually. Uh, and, from an indigenous culture, um, but they're looking at it for the future. Um, and then you might be just wanting to learn our cultural heritage. Um, you know, this is sort of a, this is a, um, a drawing from Mission Garden, um, kind of depicting like very old Tucson. This is actually looking off of A Mountain, um, down onto Mission Garden, what it used to look like. And uh, anyway, you might just be interested in our, our heritage, our, our history. Or you might be just a prepper. Um, doesn't matter. Uh, like I'm, 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 I'm kind of all of these. I'm, I'm interested in all these subjects. I want that house. You want that house? Yeah. It's kind of cool, right? Yeah. I'd live there, except it'd be kind of uh, warm in this climate, especially yeah. on the top floors. Cool. Yeah. Um, so there's a serious subject that I want to talk about before we dive into this subject, and it's important. So please bear with me. Um, but it's an important subject to talk about. Um, we need to always see this subject through the lens of respect. Um, the, a lot of the plants that are native here, they're, they're all under threat by various things. Not everything's you know going extinct yet, but um, some are. Like the, the plant in this picture is, is uh, Tumamoka. It's, a, it's in the cucurbitaceae. It's related to cucumbers, but it's an edible vine uh, with edible fruit and it's very rare. It um, used to be pretty prevalent in the Tucson mountains but um, for some reason it's not uh, doing well in these uh, modern times and it's, it's pretty rare. So just be aware of first of all plants that are vulnerable. Um, don't don't uh, you know be harvesting native medicines and just because they're medicinal and not consider that they, uh, they might be under threat. And on the subject of that, um, people sometimes often say, well, um, you know, native people are collecting, they have collected this stuff forever, so why can't we? Um, and no one is actually telling you that you can't collect stuff in, from the wild. Like wild crafting, I have mixed feelings about it, to be honest, but um, 
Um, I think if you know that you're not impacting a species adversely, um, that's the first thing you should look at. The second thing you should look at is capitalism fundamentally changes the effect that human use has on natural resources. What I mean by that is when native people gathered food, they were gathering it for themselves. They weren't selling it on Etsy. You know what I mean? So like, um, you know, if you're, if you turn native foods and wild crafting into a business, um, you're putting this huge pressure on wild plants. Um, so, you know, uh, be mindful of that and just know what you're doing. Like do your research and don't just look for the answer you want to hear. Please, please really try to truly understand the effect you're having on the plants. Some of these that we'll be talking about today are, are plants that have, are prevalent. So you're not, you're not going to be putting mesquites in danger, um, prickly pears, you know, that these plants are going to be around for a long time. So, um, they're not threatened, but, uh, still be mindful and don't over collect. Don't, don't take every single fruit off of every single plant, leave more than half, you know, um, um, take very little and leave some, not just for the plant to reproduce with, if it's a fruit and has seed in the fruit, um, but also for the wildlife that depends on that same stuff. And we will realize that everything we're talking about, you could grow at home. So, um, go to the nursery where they've, they've been growing this stuff in cultivation and, um, and then grow it in your yard. Uh, you can grow enough prickly pear very easily to make, um, you know, all the prickly pear that you're going to need. Same with mesquites and choyas or whatever. So just, I just want to always put, make people aware of that because it's important. It's important to, to know the effect you have on your environment. And this is a problem. If you know what white sage is, um, it became, a, you know, a thing where people like to burn white sage and now white sage is threatened. Um, and, um, so, you know, be aware. Also be aware when you buy stuff is, is the impact that we're having on it, threatening it, you know, were there questions? Yep. Okay. So, uh, all right, I'll get off my soapbox. Um, here's some resources that, the, some, I, I always talk about books cause I like books. Um, the first set of books, um, that I'm just going to show you, and this is by no means, this is just like kind of a random plop, a few pictures on here, but there's a lot of resources on native plants as food. Um, the, uh, eat mesquite, and more is a really great cookbook um, that put out put out by Desert Harvesters, um, and and everyone who contributed recipes. It's like the who's who of Tucson. There's um, all kinds of chefs and plant people, and just like all kinds of great people who contributed recipes um, to that book. So Eat Mosquito More is really great. We actually sell it. We still have copies, right? I think so. Yeah. So we sell it. Uh, uh, Carolyn Neathammer who also, I think, contributed some recipes in Eat Mosquito More, has a, a, a slew of her own books and does a great job with um, presenting um, a lot of the native food um, traditions in a pretty easy to... Um, um, hey, Robert Anthony V is calling me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, uh, in, in a very easy to use form. So uh, she's great. Um, Southwest Foraging is a great resource. I do wish it, uh, that the author um, emphasized ethical um, wild crafting a little bit more. So uh, that's the only thing I'd say about that book. Just be careful, like I said, about what you collect. Um, and that Food Plants of the Sonoran Desert by Wendy Hodgson is sort of a, a distillation of all the ethnobotanies of the region. Oh. And... Um, uh, that, so that's a good, that's a really good book. Uh, the, 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 oh. the other book you see there, People of the Desert and Sea, okay. a lot of that information is actually in Wendy's book because she did a very thorough job in researching that subject. Okay. So, yeah, we're um, Katie, yeah. <laughs> so, um, so anyway, there's a lot of ethnobotanies too. I put Richard Felger's ethnobotany, People of the Desert and Sea, that's on the Seri Indians. But there, there's many, there's many, there's actually several books on the Tohono O'odham and, um, you know, and, and on Navajo. So, um, you know, look up these books, you'll learn a lot. But looking up the history 
um, of native plant use it, and all the books on it um, are important, but also um, learning modern skills. And so I read a lot of books on on food, learning food skills, whether it's fermentation or food preservation or just science, the science of food. What's going to make you successful at, at uh, utilizing native plants as food is having uh, skills and knowing what to do with food. And a lot of it's just about preserving food. But also a lot of these foods need some um, work to become edible and or palatable. And there's a difference between edible and palatable, right? There's a lot of things that are edible, but they're not necessarily palatable. palatable. So... Um, so we're going to go over some of the, those techniques. But these are just some of the books that I really love. I really love that Bar Tartine book. Um, it's European-oriented, but you can take a lot of the ingredients and switch them out and learn and apply the techniques to native foods. Same with the, the Asian food traditions, which is not a, a lot of books in English on, but, but Sander Katz, The Art of Fermentation, um, he has a lot of those traditions covered in his book. Um, so I recommend that one highly, um, you know, learn how to make miso, but apply it to teperies, right? So, um, so learning to, to work with our traditions and then applying new techniques, um, is what's going to really innovate and uh, innovate our use of these foods. So, um, this is just a couple snapshots of, of some things. These are all just different preserves that that uh, either we or our friends have done, um, you know, whether it's uh, um, elderberry syrup um, or uh, uh, that the uh, powder there is a powder made out of um, Sonoran edamame that's been roasted and dried, and, and we'll talk about what that means. Um, there's a, some pickled uh, barrel cactus that me and my kids made um, in that jar there. Um, there's some dried wolfberries and, you know, it just, it's about making products. It's making spices and stuff. Um, pickling, um, mimicking things that are done in other places and applying them to our ingredients. So these are the basic methods that we're going to sort of talk about as we go through the different ingredients. Um, obviously eating them fresh. There's some things that, that, uh, well, you still need to learn when to pick those things, right? So there's, you, that's still a skill that you need to learn and the only way to really learn that is to engage it and, and make mistakes um, and uh, until you get it right. So learning how to eat it fresh, of course, um, like uh, a lot of flowers are edible and um, a lot of berries are edible um, and still sweet before being turned into a preserve or something. Um, dehydrating makes a lot of things edible and, and preserved. Um, by the way, when we're talking about both making <coughs> things edible and preserving them so that that uh, you can make the most of your harvest because most of the time everything is uh, ready at once and so you you're trying to uh, preserve your harvest right um, so a lot of the, a lot of these methods not only do they make good food but they also store your food uh, so dehydrating is one of those methods um, preserves and jellies you know um, if you learn how to just make any basic preserves out of any fruit you reapply that to our our native foods Brining is uh, basically just pickling, but it's it's pick, it's not the kind of pickling where you use fermentation. It's just using salts and um, salts and or brine uh, or you know pickled juice um, as opposed to lacto fermentation, which is um, an active live fermentation that does the same thing. It's preserving the food um, and turning them into something different. And, and uh, actually, brining and Lacto-fermentation um, are methods that are similar to cooking. They, they convert the food in a way that it's more edible in a lot, in, in a lot of cases. Um, distilling is something we don't think about a lot, but ferment, fermentation we think you know uh, of a lot. But, but um, a lot of our ingredients can also be distilled, and we'll talk about some of those things that has been done here. Um, tinctures and infusions, that's storing the flavor. Let's say you don't have a lot of a certain ingredient you can make a it go a long way if you store it as a flavor component especially as a tincture um, so um, you know I helped a friend develop a, a recipe um, he's a uh, bar not a bartender he's like a, 
a, a, a, a drink artist, <laughs> but um, we, there was a native um, plant called Agastache, which has a very unusual flavor, and we made a tincture out of it, which he could apply to drinks. And we didn't have a lot of that plant to, to you know, as an ingredient, so um, making it into a tincture is something that took that small amount of plant and made it go far. So, um, you know, and influencing the dish with flavor. Obviously, grinding stuff, drying and grinding stuff into flours and spices is a way to preserve these foods. Syrups, uh, which is different than making preserves. Syrups is like making a, a you know, adding sugar and, and uh, you know, cooking it into a syrup, which you use, again, as a flavor ingredient. It's like a liquid spice you can think of it as. Um, specialized, there's many specialized fermentation processes, like making miso that can be applied. Blanching is something that we do to stuff that, like uh, oak, like acorns that aren't edible until you blanch them. Um, so, uh, and, and blanching is basically boiling things in water. Um, and then uh, boiling, frying, baking, etc., cooking, basically. So, uh, let's talk about mesquite. This is obviously one of the most popular things that, that people talk about and know about. Um, so, we have three native mesquites that, that are great for this. Um, three, are, three of our main native mesquites. Um, Persopus volutina, which is the velvet mesquite. Persopus glandulosa, the western honey mesquite. And Persopus pubescens, the, um, the uh, common name. <laughs> Scrooby mesquite. Scrooby mesquite. I just had a senior moment. Um, all these are edible. Even the scrooby mesquite, uh, it, has, it actually is very good. It's very sweet. Um, it's the endocarp in the pod that's what we really go after. But um, but uh, and you know there's there's some traditional ways of of harvesting um, mesquite that's very very work intensive and you can do it, but it takes a long time to make a little bit of food. So in the modern way of dealing with stuff, um, oh. Well, yeah, we, we use mills, and it's a hammer mill that's used. Unfortunately, right now, because of COVID, it's been a little bit difficult to, um, it's been a little bit difficult to get access to a hammer mill. They're very expensive. I actually looked into getting one, and it was like, nope. <laughs> uh, it's very expensive. Um, per, uh, the, uh, the Desert Harvesters people had, one or have one, but I think it, that it's down right now. But it's also COVID, so there people aren't doing public events. So right now, it's not happening. But um, but uh, basically, you're collecting the dry pods from a tree, um, and you taste them because that they don't always taste the same. There's a lot of genetic diversity. Um, also, uh, collect your uh, mesquite pods if you can, far away from um, landscapes. Um, you see if you can get out in nature and collect them because um, mesquites hybridize readily and a lot of the mesquites that are in cultivation even when they're sold as native mesquites are not because um, if they were if the seeds collected off of anywhere in town they're going to be hybridized and um, unfortunately the non-native mesquites kind of don't taste that great and so when they influence the flavor of the mesquite flower, it's not positive. So um, you want to go out and get your mesquite flower away from human habitation if you can. Um, May and June is, is before monsoon season is the best time to uh, get them because we're trying to avoid, there's a, there's a toxin that develops from, a, oh, I believe it's a fungus or a mold, but, um, but it, it, it can make you sick. So um, you want to collect them before monsoon and um, avoid pods from the ground because they probably have um, developed some of that. They can they can develop some of that problem. Um, you can dry them in the sun if they're still a little bit moist or green, um, and uh, or you know put them in the oven. Um, and then you store them in a dry location in the house where it won't get wet or develop a mold. And then whenever we ever have a milling event, you can develop you can. Uh, you can get them, go get them milled, and you can try to do it at home. And I've seen people try. Uh, again, it's a lot of work for so little flour. Um, so uh, if you're very, very um, motivated to do that, uh, go look on YouTube. 
um, there's people who have done it with like, you know, uh, uh, what do you call those things? Um, you know, the, the things you can hook up to your, um, oh, gosh, what is that thing called? Um, the same things you make sausage with. Oh, your KitchenAid. Yeah, like the KitchenAid um, has a, yeah, or people use, um, you know, food processors too, but it's really not, it's, it's difficult. So that's why I, if I haven't tried it, then it's, you know, like usually it's really hard and probably not worth it. Now, if I'm wrong about that and some, some, somebody's come up with a really good method that doesn't involve a hammer mill um, of making mesquite flour, please let me know because uh, I am willing to try anything. Um, now, uh, in, in a milling event, usually a five gallon bucket, um, contains about seven pounds of pods and that'll turn into four pounds of flour. So that gives you an idea of how much flour you get out of how many pods. Um, and, uh, you know, desert harvesters think, I mean, it, this might change. This is, this has been up to now, I guess, but $3 a pound is what they charge for the events. Um, usually happens in June, but they've been offering millions at other times of the year because of requests except for now because of covid um so uh the other things that are um edible are the flowers um not the funnest things in the world to eat but if you were hungry they are great to eat <laughs> um the green pods can be eaten um and eaten fresh kind of like if you get them young enough and green enough you just open open them up and eat them like uh, eat the little peas out of the pods um, and then the sap can be made into syrup um, also uh, let's see I think I have this in here um, yeah you can make syrup out of the pods too by cooking them in water you can just kind of like macerate them a little bit or I mean you know uh, um, crack them a Bust up the pods a little bit so that when you put them in water and the, the, you boil the water, that the water has access to the insides of the pods where all the sugar is. And then you just cook it down until you get a syrup. You got to reduce it. Reduction is a very important method for eliciting flavor out of these foods. Um, you know, because sometimes you, if you're making something that's too diluted, it's not, you're not going to have that flavor influence. So you cook it down. You, redu you make a reduction. And the longer you cook it down, the more you get that true flavor um you, the more you make that true flavor obvious to people and mesquite flour has its own unique flavor so it's it's pretty cool um some commercial sources from for mesquite flour if you want to play around the ingredient but don't have time or uh or don't want to make it the flour yourself um i highly recommend my the top source there the san javier co-op farm buy it from indigenous people that's their food they, they gave it to us. And, you know, historically, we made fun of them for a long time and treated them poorly for eating this food. And so suddenly us being interested in it, if you can understand what that, from their perspective, what that looks like, it's very nice of them to um, offer that food to us after the history of how we made fun of them. So, um, so uh, be very respectful. And and give them your money to them. There's some other places that have it too, and 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 they um, benefit uh, indigenous people. But buying it from them directly is the best way to do it. Um, saguaro. This is a food that I uh, I really push to respect. Um, it's a sacred, very very sacred plant to this region. Um, it's also dependent upon by a lot of wild creatures as well. Um, and so um, um, approach this um, food with a lot of respect. Um, do not take it off of public lands. Do not, uh, please don't go on to um, the, the nation and take it off their land either, please, unless they're taking you there and you're really lucky if they do that for you. Um, get it off of private land that you have, you know, that you have um, permission, and just take a few. Don't take a lot. Um, leave some for the the bats and the white winged doves, doves. And there's a lot of creatures that depend on that as a food source. So don't uh, don't take it up all for yourself. This is something that should never really be in a restaurant menu, and um, 
and if you have it, it's something that's really special and you should treat it as sacred. And um, yeah, so, uh, you know, um, the, the, they're harvested with giant sticks. Um, and there's, um, you know, you, you, you knock them off and you catch them in a bucket. Um, Let's see, I went through this. Do, uh, do so on private land, don't take too much. Collect ripe fruits that are still in the cactus. You, you don't really wanna grab the ones on the ground. Once the ants have gotten into them, they sort of uh, they sort of start that fermentation process and it's not a good one. So, you know, don't, uh, don't collect the ones on the ground. Um, and, uh, the, you know, the ripening is a gradual process. So like once it first starts in May, um, it'll continue into June. Sometimes you get some really early ones and late ones. Like it's not always predictable, especially with our weird weather patterns. Um, and uh, let's see, we've, um, you might find some also that have landed in bushes and they haven't hit the ground and they're not covered in ants. Um, those are good, those you can collect. Um, th this is called a kui pod. That's the stick that they, that the Tahana Autumn use to uh, collect the fruit. So, um, you know, you can make your own version of this if you're going to collect that fruit. Uh, this is the, a very typical way of eating it. You just dry it, you pull it out of the, uh, out of its uh, case and, and just dry it. And this is delicious all on its own. But another thing you can do is make syrup. And uh, the process of making syrup, you actually get two products. So you boil it down, and it's full of seeds, right? So you boil it, you boil it down, and then you pour it over a screen um, and sift out the um, the the uh, solids, and um, you're left with the syrup um, and the cake, which you can dry and uh, and store. The cake's going to be kind of seedy, and you can make a flour out of this. Actually, um, it's it's delicious; has a nice roasty flavor. Um, but the syrup's just amazing, and that, there's a there's a great way to take what you're not going to get a lot of saguaro fruits because you shouldn't be out there over collecting them. Um, but you, the syrup can go a long way into influencing many um, dishes um, along the way. So, uh, so that's saguaro. Um, there's some edible flowers that uh, that come from our are um, keystone trees. Keystone means they're very important and affect the environment all around them. Um, ironwood flowers are delicious and so are Palo Verdes. Personally, I prefer the, the uh, Foothills Palo Verde. It's got a, it's a, it's, it's not as uh, bright yellow. It's got a lighter yellow color, but they're sweeter. But both ironwood and Palo Verde um, can make what's called Sonoran edamame. Um, or desert edamame. And so um, you're going to blanch these. Th those pods will be sort of greenish beige and um, you, you boil them in water and salt and um, and then you pull the, you, you just pull those little green seeds out of there and eat it like edamame. Or you can use them in salads um, or the other thing you can do is uh, after you've uh, have done that you can dry them and um, powder them, and then you have a flour. So um, now normally these pods are not edible in this way. So you have to actually go through this blanching process. You know, you pick them greenish, you, uh, um, and some people will actually sprout them too to make them edible. And, um, and then, uh, um, and then you can dry them and turn them into a flower. Um, so it's not as easy as making mesquite flour, but in some ways it's easier because um, it's the seeds, not the pods. And um, I mean, it's still, it's, it still requires a lot of work to make a little bit of food, but it's a little easier to do than trying to mill mesquite without a hammer mill. Um, the sprouted edamame, I mean, the sprouted um, ironwood Palo Verde seeds uh, is sort of an amazing um, innovation that I think is pretty cool. Um, that's, uh, uh, it's, you know, it's rendering something that's not as edible beforehand into something that's very edible. So pretty cool. You're going to peel off the outer peel, um, when you eat the sprouted seeds. Um, there's a lot of ed other edible flowers in, um, in our region a lot. I don't, I don't, I'm not even scratching the surface on them, but, um, yuccas, 
um, have edible flowers and edible fruits. Um, the uh, yellow bells and the orange bells and, and you know the various colors that Tacoma comes in. That's Tacoma stands. The one that's native here is Tacoma stands variety angustata. Um, the ones that you find like up in the Tucson mountains. Um, they're, the flowers are edible. Um, that little flower on the lower right hand corner is uh, Streptanthus. It's known as Arizona jewel flower. Um, also a really good wildlife plant. Um, it's a larval food plant for, uh, what is that? It's a, a little yellow butterfly that I, oh, the Sarah orange tip. Um, it's a white and orange butterfly. But um, the uh, agave flowers are all edible. Um, Palo Verde, I mean, sorry. Uh, yeah, I already said Palo Verde, but the desert willow flowers are edible. And the entire coral, uh, queen's wreath is edible. Now that queen's wreath, um, you, uh, you can eat the entire plant. Um, the funny thing about this plant, it's, it's native, you know, to Mexico. If you go south of the border here, you start to see it in the hillsides, especially on disturbed soils. It's kind of everywhere and it can be even invasive a little bit. It is an, an invasive plant in other regions of the world, like in tropical regions. In Thailand, for example, it's everywhere. And in Thailand, they're totally use, utilizing it as a food. And they, uh, they like to batter the leaves and deep fry them. I have not tried that yet, and I am totally going to try it. It sounds amazing. Um, but uh, it's something I've been threatening to do for a while. Why don't we do that? I guess you do that soon. We got a plant in the front yard. Um, yeah, you can batter and deep fry the flowers too. The entire plant's edible. So, um, so yeah, queen's wreath is a pretty cool plant, and it's very fast growing. Once you get one established, or get a few established, you'll have so much. You'll you'll have plenty of food out of that plant. Um, Ocotillo flowers, and this includes any of the Fuki area. Uh, um, so Fuki area is, uh, is also the genus for the um, Bujum tree. And there's several other species, like what, nine, 10 species, I think, something like that. Um, they all have edible flowers and they have a, a very unique flavor. Um, I think the best way to, I mean, you can, you can eat them fresh, you can make a tea out of them. I think the best use of them, again, is making a syrup that lasts a while. But also, when you make a syrup out of it, so again, cooking it down with, uh, cooking it down in some water, maybe adding a little sugar to it, and then making a reduction of it, meaning cook it down so that it turns into a syrup, not, not a tea, um, you really bring that flavor out. And you bring the unique, you, the unique flavors that are kind of hidden when it's more diluted. That is the ongoing theme in a lot of what we're talking about today, um, eliciting the flavor. What is the best way to elicit the flavor out of that plant? Um, and there's, you know, when we're eating, what are we looking for? I guess two things, sustenance, you know, so nutrition and filling your belly and flavor, like the enjoyment of it, right? So that's, uh, you're always kind of balancing those two things out. And not all of our desert foods are going to be the most um, sustaining types of foods. They're not going to, you know, prevent you from dying in the desert maybe, <laughs> but, uh, but you'll die happy because it's delicious. Um, no, I mean, there's a lot of foods that, uh, that are more for flavor and less so for, uh, a, a substance, a substance, a substance. So, um, you know, uh, this is one of those foods, but it's delicious. And there are, a lot of these foods that um, you only eat a little bit of or only influence your dishes with as a spice or as a syrup or whatever have medicinal properties too. Um, it's not something that I personally keep track of, um, but I do know in general that when you eat regionally, it's very good for you, especially if you are indigenous. All these indigenous foods, um, almost all of them have shown health benefits that specifically address problems that indigenous people are having because um, when when the um, invaders came into this country and imposed their diet on indigenous people and forced them away from their native foods, uh, they got away from their native foods that they evolved with. And what happens is they started having diabetes and other problems when they lived our lifestyle. So... Um, when they, whenever they've gotten back to their own lifestyle and their own native foods, it's been very beneficial for them. They, they're not getting diabetes and all these problems that 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 they've had. So, um, their food is is a beautiful and healthy food. Um, 
Here's another thing that's kind of cool and I would say an innovative thing that, you know, so something that wasn't necessarily, it, it was in indigenous cultures, but maybe not to the same, not in the same way that it is in, in European or Japanese cultures. And that's a lot of pickling, um, mainly because they didn't have a lot of vinegars. Um, they did ferment stuff like saguaro fruit and they turned it into saguaro wine and they had you know, polke, the, you know, a beer like thing, substance from agave and a few things like that, but they didn't do a lot of pickling because there just wasn't a lot of that around. Um, you know, a lot of the, the stuff you use for pickling. Um, so one, uh, in this case here, I don't know if you can see that picture on the, that's imposed on top of that, uh, that, uh, creosote bush. Um, but you know, it might remind you of capers. And this is what I call the Sonoran caper. Um, you can take um, the flower buds. So before the flowers open up on a creosote bush, you harvest them and you pickle them like a caper. And that is what a caper is, by the way. A caper it comes from a caper plant, a uh, capera spinosis, native to the um, Mediterranean Africa. And, um, and then they pickle the flower buds. Actually, they also pickle the fruits and and the leaves too. But in the case of creosote bush, it's just the flower buds we're going to go after. The leaves are not going to really make a good food. Um, and, and, uh, the fruits are probably not either, but the, uh, flower buds really do make a cool little caper. So that's kind of cool, right? Um, choyas, um, are very important, um, very abundant. Um, the culture around choya, um, I was just watching something, uh, I was watching a Tahon Odom lady collect choya and she was talking about how um, in their culture, if you don't collect enough choya bud, um, that their, their, um, their gods get upset because they're like, we made this food for you, it's prevalent, it's everywhere. This is a really important food. It, it, it is and was an important food for the region because it's abundant, um, harvesting, Choya buds do not um, negatively impact the um, populations of choyas. If anything, it probably increases them because you're going to knock off some choya buds and they will make um, new plants. So if you know anything about choyas, they, they readily reroot. So uh, you when you collect a choya bud, it's before the flower opens up. And uh, in that one picture there, you can see a pretty close up view of what that kind of looks like. And um, the spines are surprisingly easy to get off of the buds. Um, I think the easiest way to do it is if you got a, if you can get a big screen and then put some choya buds in the screen and they're just going to shake the screen, um, the, the, the spines will kind of come off in the screen and fall through the screen. Um, but there's many ways some people use fire and, and you, you actually can get some flavor out of using fire too. If you use a blowtorch and burn the spines off, you also, um, add the same kind of flavor as you do when you roast chilies, right? So, um, so that's another method too, but, uh, you, you cook these for like a, an, at least an hour and then, um, either eat them after that, add them as a, as an ingredient, or you can take that after they've been boiled and dry them for the future and then they store forever. And then when you cook them again, you do have to cook them along. You cook them for a, a long time to rehydrate and make them soft again, but they are delicious. Um, so important food, if you were actually were trying to live out in the desert, I would take full advantage of the choya buds. Um, and, uh, you know, during that season, which is, uh, spring, um, you know, when they're doing their thing, you know, if you were trying to survive out in the desert, you would, you would pick a lot of choya buds and boil and dry them for the future. That would be an important thing to do. Um. We have an abundance of berries in the desert, surprisingly, um, if you know where to look. The purple berry there is a, um, a gray thorn. Um, a lot of these berries are, you know, they're not going to compare to blueberries or these crops that we have like hybridized the heck out of and selected for eons. They're, they are a little more insipid. But they're sweet and they have their own flavor. Um, again, this these are so these are berries you can eat sweet and I mean you can eat fresh and they're sweet enough and you can enjoy them. The other thing to do with them, of course, is is uh, again making syrup. 
And so this is a syrup of wolfberry. Oh, let me go back. The three pictures here, the, the, the purple fruits is, is graythorn, Sisyphus obtusifolia. The bright red fruits is wolfberry, which is, is our native goji berry. So, and when I say that, I don't mean it's kind of like goji berry. I mean, it's literally in the same genus. So it's lyceum. Um, and, and there's, we have like many species of lyceum in Arizona in, in the region here, there's like three or four. So depending on where you are. So, um, and, but in the whole state, I think there's like 12 or something. Um, so they, they're all a little different. Um, they all have their own little flavor. Again, they're also influenced a lot by, by, uh, um, their own genetics too, um, much like, uh, mesquite. And also, I also have this suspicion, and this is, I got from a friend of mine too, my friend Noel, who we go, we've gone in the past and picked uh, um, prickly pear fruits, um, that w we've suspected that there's maybe some stuff happening in the soil too. When you have pack rats who've been storing stuff down in the ground there forever, that's nutrition in the soil, and that's going to affect the flavor of fruits as well. So um, there's a terroir, you know. Um, and then that orange fruit is the desert hackberry. Now both hackberries are edible. The canyon hackberry is the more larger tree hackberry. And then on the drier hillsides you have the desert hackberry. Um, the desert hackberry uh, is the, the sweeter and the more enjoyable of the two. Um, both can be made into syrups, but the desert hackberry is one you probably want to eat fresh. Um, but anyway, here's the wolfberry syrup. We actually made this for uh, a fundraiser for Watershed Management Group. Um, we were doing like these cocktails, um, live online cocktail hour or something. It was like cocktails in history or something like that. Anyway, uh, this is this came out really nice. And and uh, so when when you eat this wolfberry by itself, it's a very different flavor than when it's been concentrated like this. And so um, all this was was the fruits that had been. Um, you know, mashed up and boiled in water with sugar and then reduced. And, um, and again, reduced reduction is when you just cook it until the more of the water goes away and you get a, a thicker and thicker, more viscous, um, substance. And, uh, the flavor that can, can, that comes out of this is so different and so unique. It's really cool. So, um, again, this is something that we do a lot, um, and to elicit new flavors out of our native foods. Um, I didn't mention this, but uh, th this little mammalaria the, is edible too. And I haven't made syrup out of this yet, but I should try. Um, there, uh, you know, we have we have a, quite a few mammalarias in our yard, and I think there's a bunch of fruits on them right now. So, I should try to make a syrup out of that. Um, but anyway, that's edible, and you can go pick them and eat them fresh too. They look like little chili peppers when you pull them out. Um, now, in the higher elevations, we actually have our own native cherries, and they don't taste that great um, when you eat them fresh. But again, uh, you turn them into a preserve or a syrup, and they're delicious. Um, elderberry. We have uh, four species, I think, of elderberry. Well, four taxa, I should say, because a few of the species are in the same. They've been it's, anyway. It's taxonomy. I'll bore you with that. But there's there's four, there's at least four types of uh, elderberries in our region, and um, and the elderberry flower is an important and well known uh, amongst a lot of people because you have elderberries in Europe, right? So um, you might be familiar with Saint Germain, that elderberry flower liqueur, um, that's made out of the flower of this plant, and ours can do the same. Um, and then there's the fruit. Now the fruit are not really really edible raw. Um, in fact, I think some of them are even kind of poisonous. Now, how poisonous they are fresh, they're not going to kill you, but they probably won't make you feel very good. But what you do is, again, you make a preserve out of it. So um, you're cooking them with sugar, and then you, you, know, um, you add some pectin and turn it into a preserve. And then it's delicious and unique and super healthy for you. Um, like if you have uh, the COVID, <laughs> um, if you have COVID-19, uh, this would probably be a really good thing to, to have because it, it's, it's very, uh, I think it's very antiviral. So, um, very medicinal, but also delicious as a preserve. Here's one of my favorites. Um, 
um, rosehip jelly. So, um, you know, we have a, a few species of native roses, and this is these are actual pictures of, uh, of preserves that we made at our house out of uh, um, plants that were growing at uh, uh, Katie's um, dad's house, uh, parents' house. And uh, her dad had planted this Rosa woodsii, and it's huge. And, um, and uh, so, you know, rose hips, same thing, on their own, not very edible um, or palatable, but you cook them down and, um, um, and then you turn them into a preserve with some pectin. Pectin is just what makes it solid, makes it more like a jelly or a jam more like a jam and uh, also very very um, healthy um, full of calcium and vitamin C and and all that um, here is a, a project that we did a few years ago with my kids um, this is a the barrel cactus so like you've seen this thing around I'm sure in landscapes the the cactus it looks like it has little pineapples on the top um, now, by itself, it's not very edible, but uh, you, you, uh, you take the, that fruit and you cook them down. The seeds can be roasted and um, either turned into a flower or whatever, um, or just eaten. But the, um, the flesh on the outside, you cook down and you can make it into a preserve. Um, but it doesn't have a lot of its own liquid, and so uh, I like to use it um, as a chutney, and that's what that picture is. That jar is a we made a chutney out of it so um, we followed an Indian recipe and uh, and use the the cactus fruit in that recipe so pretty cool um, there's prickly pear and uh, and uh, my kids um, picking fruit off of a prickly pear um, and uh, um, so one warning about prickly pear um, and this is something that Katie and I discovered <laughs> Or redis I rediscovered it, and um, maybe it was your rediscovery too. But no, that was new to me. That was your first time. Yeah. So prickly pear is so if you're making your own prickly pear, right, and you make a syrup out of it, um, it's going to be pretty concentrated. Prickly pear is a powerful medicine, and it's going to bring your blood pressure down, which is a fantastic thing about cactus. Um, and especially prickly pear, it's it's one of the health benefits of it. If you um, use too much of it, and let's say a, a margarita, <laughs> let's say you made, let's just say that you might have made a, a margarita out of prickly pear, and you just use a good amount of syrup because it's so delicious, um, you might have flu-like symptoms afterwards. <coughs> <laughs> yeah. so like we did this you know and we just had a, and we was just like a, a little cocktail but we mixed it really strong with i mean not with a lot of alcohol but strong with a lot of prickly pear because we really loved that flavor and um and then we were in two different places after that moment and we were texting each other like i i said i think i got the flu or something i feel like i had the flu and she's like i feel that way too and then i don't remember how Somehow we figured it out. Either I remembered or somebody said something, but um, the, this brings your blood pressure down so far that it makes you feel like you have the flu. So be careful <laughs> when you use prickly pear syrup. Just use a little bit, enough to you know influence, and you can. There's plenty. There's plenty of flavor, and you don't have to use as much as we did to do that. It was kind of ridiculous how much we used, and uh, so just be careful. It can be, if you get flu-like symptoms, you're not allergic or anything. It's just it brings your blood pressure down, so that's why it does that. Um, now that, uh, clear drink on the side there, I may know somebody who may have, um, made their own, uh, hooch in their backyard and out of prickly pear. And this drink was delicious. So, um, for the first thing that was done in this instance, um, was, uh, the fermentation process. So smashing up the fruits and adding, um, champagne yeast. And turning it into a, a wine of sorts, but maybe not a wine you definitely not wine one that you necessarily want to drink, or maybe if you you know process it a little bit. But then you take that substance and you distill it. Now, what distillation is is uh, you bring um, a liquid up to a temperature where the alcohol evaporates, but the water stays behind. And I forget what that temperature is, but there's a temperature that you're hovering at, 
And that's what makes alcohol. That's what distillation is. That's how they turn wine into brandy. That's how they turn uh, pulque into tequila. Pulque is fermented agave. And, um, oh, well, it's not really pulque, but fermented agave, uh, it turns into, it, it's like a liquid. And then you, you again, boil the um, alcohol into another chamber, um, tequila or mezcal. Um, so uh, this is that version of prickly pear, and it was it's it's the, one of the most delicious things I've ever had. You can still taste the prickly pear. It does not just taste like fire water. It actually has that that almost perfumey, bright um, bright uh, flavor that prickly pear is so known for. Um, now there's uh, uh, nopalitos or nopales. Um, now the best uh, cacti for nopales are not necessarily our our native cacti, but they're everywhere here, um, particularly that Apuntia ficus indica. That's the big cactus that kind of grows all over town and and uh, forms the, the big tree-like plants sometimes. And and uh, so um, you see them a lot, you know, totally not taken care of, but if you take really good care of your, um, your um, Apuntia ficus indica, and uh, you get the new growth off of it, um, you turn it into nopales. And, and so, um, you know, that's about the size you're looking at right there. They've been trimmed. You trim the sides off and you, of course, take off the spines and then you cook them after this. Um, nopales, uh, you need to learn how to use them and cook them right. It's just like okra in that it can be slimy if you don't do it right. Um, and of course, it's just adding them where you want they're crunchy and maybe slightly slimy flavor in there. I love nopales so much. When I get uh, my chimichanga uh, at, at various places, if they have nopales, I always add nopales in with my uh, carne seca chimichanga because it's a good. That's a good mix. So you got carne seca, which is a little drier, and you add in the nopales. Oh my god, that's so good and so healthy. Um, you, you you do a good poop the next day on that one. Um, <laughs> Um, here's a funny one that, um, if you're from other regions of this country, um, there's a lot of poisonous plant plants in this fam, this genus, Roos. Uh, one of the Rooses is poison ivy, um, and poison sumac, but almost all of our Rooses are edible. Um, we have the two species of poison ivy in Arizona, but almost all the other, um, Roos produce edible fruits. So... Uh, that fuzzy uh, red fruit there is is uh, is is what you do. There's you can make a syrup out of this. There's a big seed in the middle, um, so the the actual fruit part of it's kind of thin. But you, again, if you make a syrup out of it, you're gonna elicit that flavor, and it's its own unusual flavor, um, akin to tamarind, and that's actually what influences uh, this drink, which is where you take. This is actually uh, this is actually what we did um, at uh, at the old Wajolote. Um, that uh, we, we collected uh, the fruits of Roost trilobata, which is uh, the one of the most common ones in the um, foothills and mountain sides of uh, Arizona. And um, you just kind of smash them down in the water and let them sit. And uh, you you can actually also kind of cook them into like a tea. And the resulting drink is is like a lemonade type of drink, and people used to drink that to stay cool in the summer. Those astringent type drinks, if you notice all over the world, there's always some version of that tamarindo, that astringent uh, flavor, uh, or uh, Jamaica has that astringent flavor too. Um, you know, people drink it to cool off. So um, this is our native version of it. Um, and, uh, you know, it can be sweetened too. Um, we have our own Arizona native walnut. So of course, walnut has a history of use. And the, you know, of course you could just eat the walnuts. Um, but the thing I'm kind of interested in is this, which is a traditional English um, pickle uh, or preserve. So you pick the fruits before they get hard in the middle um, because you know that they have that, first of all, that uh, the Arizona walnut has such an amazing flavor. I mean, sorry, uh, aroma. The 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 fruits, the leaves, the whole plant has this. Um, you know how to describe that smell? I mean, it's just like a perfumey. Yeah, I don't. It's it's its own smell. But um, 
but they they pick the fruits very young and still tender and then they pickle them and um and then you know they can they can be sliced now you can't slice a walnut usually right that so this is like when it's been picked green and pickled for a long time this is not something i've done yet but it is something that we are going to do we just haven't hit the walnuts at the right time we almost i almost got it like a couple years ago and and it was just like a little too woody on the inside so we just got to get there at the right time uh here's an important one um, and a very, in, very important to this region, especially at that elevation, this uh, emery oak. So not all oaks are really that edible. Um, emery oak is really the one you want to get. Um, and it's not edible until you blanch it and make it, you know, make it edible. So, um, you know, basically uh, the, the main process here is shelling them which is actually kind of a pain in the butt, uh, which is probably why this food is not that prevalent as a as an ingredient, even though emery oak is the most common oak in, in uh, Baja, Arizona. But, um, and there's plenty of here, but it is kind of a process. Now, some people just roast them um, and, and then, you know, shell and eat them. But uh, um, if you can also shell, uh, blanch them and or roast them, um, and then uh, shell them and then powder them into a flour and then use that flour in baking and it's delicious and extremely nutritious as well. So um, so anyway, we have several oak species. I think this is the really the only one you want to be eating. There's a few that are like um, borderline edible, but just they have a lot of tannic acids in them and um, you know, so it's best to just kind of stick with what we what's really easy to make. Um, now we have a lot of uh, annual, especially winter annual weeds that are native. Um, the three in this picture, there's lamb's quarter, which is kenopodium. It's a weedy little um, plant that pops up all over the place and especially in the in the in-between seasons, especially like in the fall, in the spring, you see them a lot, um, but in the winter too. And uh, you know, it's uh, a lot of plants in this family are edible. It's the Kenopodaceae, um, which uh, includes a lot of plants. Uh, you know, auric spinach is in that family, um, but spinach has been long selected to look the way it does. But uh, but you know, you usually you can eat this raw, um, not in huge amounts, but you can, and it's actually delicious. You know, it's the this these plants pull the salts out of the ground and deposit them on the outsides of their leaves. So they have a lot of flavor, um, and nutrition. So, uh, you can, you can eat them raw, but, uh, it's best like if you cook them, just barely cook them. Um, the plant down on the bottom there is, uh, vertilagus or purslane. And that is a uh, delicious raw or cooked and, um, easy to make into great food. And lots of people probably, recognize that if you have any um history in your if you're if you have any um regional history if you've been here a long time at all your family's been here if you're mexican you've eaten vertilagus um because it's just a thing now on the top right there is a plant that not a lot of people know that's um that's edible it's inter it's introduced but it's everywhere and i do like it when there's a weed that's edible that way you can harvest the hell out of it and you don't have to feel bad. Um, that is a very, well, we're going to call that right now, we're going to call that Sonoran Agretti. Um, anyone who uh, loves Italian food, um, if you're really into especially heirloom Italian food, and if you've been to Italy, you've seen Agretti. Um, I don't know if I pronounced that right. If you if you uh, live in Japan, they have their own version of this called Okahajiki. Um, now, Okahajiki means land seaweed, but these plants are all related and they are all related to um, the, the plant up there in the corner is tumbleweed. So uh, you got to get them young when they first sprout like this is when they're edible and um, and you can eat them raw or you can um, cook them and they're delicious. And I, I really love these actually. Um, but you just got to, it's all about timing on this one. Now, sometimes you have a yard that gets a lot of this. It just comes up. So you know this plant. If you if you have this one in your yard, you know it because it comes up every year. Um, and it's with the cool season that it comes up. 
You, so you just pick it young, and uh, once it gets older, it gets too tough, and it's not very edible. But uh, agretti and okajiki have a long history. Now, one thing that you could look at doing that I actually just thought of now, um, okajiki, you know, it's a different species with very similar qualities, um, is actually pickled, too. And I haven't actually tried pickling this, so you might be able to get away with letting it get a little tougher um, if you didn't get to it in time, you can maybe pickle it, and that's something that I should probably try. But um, but anyway, uh, pretty cool, right? Uh, Sonoran Negretti instead of tumbleweed. Um, and then there's, of course, using our native plants as spices, and there's an endless, endless, I'm not even going to scratch the surface here. I think I just put in a few pictures that came up at the top of my head here. So, um, but I'll go through a few of them. That first picture on the left there is the oregano. Um, that is Aloysia ridei. It is uh, not Mexican oregano, but it kind of looks like it. And it tastes like an intense version of Mexican oregano. Now, Mexican oregano is not the same as, as, a, as a, the Mediterranean oregano's. Um, it's, you know, the, the, the Mexican oregano that you buy at Food City, that's, uh, that's a, a totally different plant and it's, um, it's, you know, more tropical. You can grow it here. Um, but, uh, but this plant is oregano. It's growing all out in the Tucson mountains, um, all over our foothills. This is all over our region and wh where it grows, it's very common. Um, it's also an incredible wildlife plant, but it smells like a, uh, a very intense um, Mexican oregano with maybe some more minty overtones. Um, so you would dry this and powder it. Um, the picture on the top right there is the um, saltbush. Saltbush can, um, you can take the leaves and dry them, you know, dehydrate them really hard and then powder them. When I say powder too, uh, Look at that Bar Tartine book. They're really good at showing you how to take an, uh, an ingredient, dry it, and powder it. But you, you basically like dry it so it's really, really dry, and then you, 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 um, you use the same mills, that they, those little hand mills that they use for spices, like for um, grinding up uh, cardamom or grinding up uh, well, coffee beans, actually. Um, but, uh, um, but there's some really good, strong little hand mills that you can get that can actually really make a good powder and that's where you can turn a lot of these um, native herbs into a, a spice that you can store and you know sprinkle and use to influence your food now these spices uh, have not been used by chefs that often hint hint any chefs out there um, I actually have spent a lot of time talking to chefs in Tucson um, I get calls all the time because they're like, I have this dinner coming up and I want to do something. And so, they, you know, people are, especially since the UNESCO City of Gastronomy designation, they've been wanting to incorporate native ingredients. So I, I'll tell them about this kind of stuff. That fuzzy looking leaf down there, you might recognize if you've grown it. Uh, that's desert lavender. It's not a lavender at all. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's a totally different genus, although same family. But, uh, but that is also, uh, can be turned into a spice if you dry it and powder it. Um, and it's, you know, kind of a lavendery sort of flavor, but it's its own, it's its own flavor. A lot of these things you just have to, when you play around with them, you just got to play around with them and, and experiment. Um, those of you who are like really into food, like we are, um, it's fun. It's really fun to play with these ingredients. Um, and sometimes you make something weird and you fail. Like, don't let that let you down. Like, that just means that you need to play around with the ingredients a little more. If the texture's off, you know, figure it out. You know, um, you know, maybe it's like, oh, I shouldn't do this. I should make this into a syrup instead of making it into a powdered thing or whatever it is. Like, you just got to play. Uh, some more spices. That, that silver leafed thing is mugwort, western mugwort, Artemisia ludoviciana. Um, grows in the foothills all over the place and it, it really likes that granity rocky soil um, you see it on you know trails that are climbing up the mountains all the time um, and uh, very intense flavor um, related by the way to um, the same um, uh, herb that makes um, absinthe so hey 
if you want to make some absinthe out of our own native plants, uh, no, I don't think anyone's done that yet. Hint, hint. Um, that little white flowered thing on the top there is pepperweed, um, which is lepidium. There's several species of lepidium. They have a very peppery flavor. Um, when they're all dry, you just kind of sh you just you, you grab them and you, you can grind them up and store them and they, they taste like pepper. Um, the yellow flower is Damianita. You might recognize that name if you know Damiana, which is that liqueur uh, made from a related plant, but not the same. This plant is native to New Mexico and it, I think it slips into uh, Arizona as well. Um, but it smells like Damiana, Damianita. It's very lemony. Uh, any descriptors there? No. No. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. Uh, yeah, kind of lemony. I don't know. How, I don't know how to describe that flavor, but it's pretty cool. Uh, again, uh, take some of the leaves, dry them, powder them. Um, use only a little bit. It's. I think it's got kind of an uh, intense chemistry, so don't dump this on your food. But, um, but uh, you know, and a lot of these too can influence um, liqueurs. You can make liqueurs out of it if you're if you're into experimenting with that. I love making this kind of stuff. So here's an example of something where that flower there is, is native yarrow. Um, so yarrow grows in our mountains here. This same species actually grows, it's, it's pan, uh, it grows all over the world. So, um, you know, you can find the same species up in the mountains in Europe, um, but it's all over the US too and in our own mountains. And um, yarrow has a very distinct flavor. Um, before they used hops to make beer, uh, we used yarrow and a couple of other herbs. So I did make a beer out of using yarrow. I did still use hops, but I used um, I, I only used hops as a um, because I didn't have the other herbs that usually go along with yarrow that have their roles, you know, for preserving the beer and all that. Um, so I just used the yarrow as a flavor component, and it was an amazing beer. Um, the resulting beer actually was was uh, very good, and it was kind of surprising because it was um, it was liked by both people who are into IPAs because it was kind of like an IPA style, but uh, but it was really refreshing. So the people who like you know, Blue Moon liked it, <laughs> which is, you don't usually play, please those two people at once. So it was kind of cool. It was only, it was a short run of beer and uh, I don't know if I could ever replicate this recipe. I did it with my friend, John Reed, uh, who, who uh, loves to make beer. But uh, um, yeah, so yeah, you can make beer with native plants. Um, oh, we do have our own native hops, which I don't have pictured here. Um, and uh, they, um, they're wild hops, so they're not gonna create the, the most, um, you know, well, I know people have to experiment with it. Um, uh, hops are also actually a good flavor component too, that you can use as a, as a, an influencing flavor. So, um, in fact, actually my friend, our friend Noel Patterson just collected a bunch of hops. I saw a picture. Oh yeah. So oh, I didn't no. ask him what he's doing with those, but he's probably going to make something cool out of them. He's, uh, he loves to experiment. Um, but anyway, uh, you probably recognize this plant. It's a total weed, um, although I think mostly native. But it's it's a it's a plant that takes over your backyard in the summertime. You might have this now, um, maybe less so this year because where the heck is the rain? Um, but uh, this is this is pigweed or amaranth. Um, yes, amaranth, the health food that you might recognize this more as amaranth. This is like the more one of the more domestic species, but um, or cultivars. But it amaranth is uh, grown both for seed and greens. If you pick these while they're young, again, get them young and tender, and you cook them. Uh, it's a it's a green you can eat, and uh, and then the seeds are edible. And it makes uh, you know amaranth flour. You can make amaranth flour. Now, whenever you get to growing something that's like a grain, it takes a lot, a lot. A lot to make a little bit of flour. So if you're trying to make amaranth flour, you got to grow a lot of amaranth. Um, so I don't really suggest doing that. I suggest, uh, and plus the the this species, amaranthus palmeri, is not the most uh, 
productive for seed, so you would have to really grow a lot of this. And please don't ever grow a farm of this. I mean, that would be such a weedy mess. Oh, my God. <laughs> Can you imagine? Your neighbors would hate your guts. Uh, <laughs> but, uh, but you know, as a, as a green that pops up in the summer, and, you know, there are not a lot of summer greens in, to eat, right? Because uh, most of our greens are winter crops. So, um, so to have a, a summer green is kind of nice, but you got to get them young and tender. Um, speaking of grains, and this is something to experiment with, but again, you know, this is something that needs to be developed, but this is the work that my mentor, uh, Richard Felger worked on as, is working on is, uh, introducing new arid land crops. Um, these are three species of grasses that have promise as a grain. Um, these are grasses that can grow on rainfall in our regions. Um, and, um, and can produce a grain. Now, a lot of these plants, you know, they're wild and undeveloped, but um, which means like there's, and you know, also our entire agriculture system is built to to uh, collect only a few different species of <clears throat> grain. So whenever you throw a new species in that has a different behavior, like they drop their seeds really fast, or they um, or the seeds stick on there too hard, or whatever it is, like it's it, it becomes a challenge to to learn how to turn into a um, commercial crop. Um, so, but but we're gonna have to look into this sometime because the planet is warming and drying and um, it's probably not gonna be the smartest thing in the world to be growing um, the crops that we grow. Uh, Arizona is the third largest producing agriculture state. We're three in a lot of things. We're the third largest flora, third uh, largest, uh, uh, diversity of birds. We're the third largest producer producing agriculture state beat out only by Florida and California. California obviously being number one, but, um, but we're number three, but we grow, we grow lettuce in Yuma and we grow cotton and we grow barley and we grow, uh, um, durum wheat and we grow durum wheat. And, and this is a little side note, but I, I think it's important to know about your food system. We grow durum wheat in Arizona, and we send it over to Italy, and they process it and turn it into a product that we buy back from them, pasta, and somehow that little pasta box of pasta only costs $1.99. Um, there's a reason that small farms can't get into the grain business. It's because it's subsidized by the government. The big, big corporations are subsidized by the government. They're not self-functioning. I mean, not self-sustaining. They, they, they're a subsidized crop and uh, they're not sustainable. And uh, it's not good for the environment. You know, think about all the fossil fuel it takes to do all this and to transport it back and forth across the ocean. It's stupid, um, but this is what we do. Um, Yuma is the capital the lettuce capital of the world. We grow more lettuce in Yuma than anywhere else. And uh, lettuce, Yuma, I mean, that place is hot. They grow it in the winter time, but it's just not very sustainable. But for some, just the way that politics went and the way that capitalism goes, we're growing lettuce in Yuma. So anyway, uh, I, get in, I, I go off on these sometimes. Um, here's a wonderful crop uh, native to here. Um, Tepperies, and uh, tepperies are, you can think of them as kind of like our, do you have a question? No. No. Okay. Um, you can think of them as our, sort of like our own native lentil bean, but I think these are have a lot more interest in flavor. And, and this is something that someone needs to make miso out of, and someone needs to make, um, uh, someone needs to make a tempeh out of this too, these beans. I think they need to be fermented in using koji or something like that, like, like they do in Asia. Um, this is a product that's like so underdeveloped and has so much promise and you can grow it on rainfall. Um, uh, that's okay. Um, and uh, let's talk about agaves. So, you know, uh, in one of our dreams is, is sometimes is to, uh, you know, we think about like starting a, a true arid land farm. Is that just me? That's you too. Yeah. yeah. And, um, where you grow truly dry land crops like mesquite and agave and, um, and you know, 
make our own products. I've always wondered why we don't have our own regional version of tequila and mezcal um, because we have agaves that can make a distillate like that. Um, but somehow we haven't really got onto that. And how cool would that be? Like low water, sustainable crop that you can actually even grow and it, within a, an environment that you don't have to disturb too much. I mean, I think that sounds like a lot better of an idea than cattle ranching and I'm not anti cattle, but, um, but, uh, I don't think it's the best idea here that that animal isn't from here and it doesn't have a good impact on our environment. Agaves do. So, um, agaves make all kinds of food, by the way, not just, um, tequila. Um, pulque, by the way, is, is agave beer. This is before you distill it. It, it is made a little differently than, than the liquid they make to make tequila, but they, agave beer can be made from agave. So basically agave um, is a very intense plant that at the very end of its life, it blooms. And when it blooms, it puts, so it, when it blooms, it puts so much energy into reproduction that it puts all of its energy into reproduction and dies. They call that monocarpic. Um, but because they're, because they do that, they produce a lot of sugar. And sugar is an important thing um, to have, uh, not because we like sugar, but it's actually important for our health. And, um, you know, we have too much of it in our lives in, in the way that things are right now. But when you think about pre-industrialization, um, you know, sugar is important. So um, agave are an important source of that and, and an important source of, of calories. So in the case of agaves, most of the time what they do is when it starts to initiate an inflorescence, kind of like in that picture there, um, uh, people will whack the top back sometimes uh, and then that energy goes back down into the, the heart or they call it the cabeza, which is what that guy's holding there. That's actually the, the, the base of the agave where the leaves have all been removed and that's post roasting. But these are, these are you know, most traditionally these were pit roasted and then turned into, into food. It's very fibrous food. Um, and you got to cook them very well to elicit because the starch is very intense. Actually, you can make soap out of it. But um, but it's it's uh, when it's cooked, it's you convert all the starches to sugars and um, and it becomes a super sweet substance. Um, you can also uh, some some people will cut the the when the bloom is a certain height but it hasn't flowered yet. They'll cut that off and cook that and that um, they elicit the sugars out of that um and uh and that the, uh, the, this stuff can also be dried like as in that picture down on the bottom right there there's many ways to sort of take advantage of the agave um plant and a lot of experimentation that could still be done uh, especially in our region where we haven't played around with our own species that often obviously the bigger agaves are going to be the ones that you do this with the little agaves don't have enough um substance to to do that much but uh it's the bigger ones and in our region that would be agave palmeri and perii but um and others but uh but yeah agave um and uh finally i just wanted to just re-emphasize this although i think i've been saying this the whole time um we have a lot of innovations that haven't been done yet and um and we can still play around like uh that's tempe um on the top left there. Vegetarians might know this food, um, but also if you're from any region that produces tempeh, it's not a vegetarian food in other cultures. It's just a food. And um, our laws about what we allow to, how much fermentation we allow, kind of limits how much of this sort of food we can have in our region because, um, I'm sorry, in, in our um, stores, let's put it that way. Uh, you can't buy real tempeh. That tempeh that they sell at the co-op, that's not real tempeh. <laughs> that stuff's uh, a very sterile version of real tempeh. Real tempeh is very moldy looking. It's got koji. Um, and it's uh, a lot more flavor and a lot more texture and much more interesting than the ingredients that, 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 than the, that vegetarian substitute that is sold in the, you know, uh, co-ops and stuff like that. So, um, anyway, we could be using a lot of our own native beans, which, you know, I only 
talked about teparies, but there's actually quite a few native beans that can be uh, eaten. And, uh, and, you know, when we think about these native foods, you can't just think about just the, 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 the thing itself, but how are you going to turn it into a, an incredible food? So, um, so yeah, using a process like um, koji, you know, introducing this mold basically that uh, converts that f the the beans into something even more digestible and pulls out flavor. That's a, a pretty cool thing. The picture on the top right there is uh, gochujang, and um, and that is uh, basically fermented um, chili paste. Actually, that might be. Uh, that's not gochujang. That's actually um, chili chili bean paste, which is a lot like a lot like gochujang, but with added beans. But anyway, um, we have our own native chili. Actually, I, there that's the plant I forgot to put in this thing. Chilta bean. Ah, oh, damn. <laughs> Every you guys all know what chilta beans are. Um, that's that's native here. You can you can find it just south of here um, in the two uh, two Mountains um, and other places, but. It's, don't collect it. Uh, don't collect that plant. Just go to Food City um, or grow a plant. But um, the wild ones are sort of under pressure, so don't collect them. But uh, chilta bean is, a, is our own native chili, and we could be making our own either gochujang or our own chili bean paste, um, which is a very staple ingredient full of umami. Um, they ferment it forever, and, uh, and they pull out all these amazing flavors. The Asians are especially China. China and Korea are amazing, amazingly talented at taking an ingredient and pulling this flavor out of it and, and making it something that's just going to make your life happier. And that's that was important around the world, especially to poor people around the world who didn't have access to the um, the luxuries that the upper classes had, but they, they didn't just make do these cultures turned, um, what they had into stuff that eventually the rich wanted. And that happens all the time, right? Uh, most of the most famous dishes and, and cuisines around the world started off as poor people food, right? And they figured out how to convert it into something amazing that makes your life better. Um, so when we talk about foods like this, it's, this is not just talking about, we're not just talking about feeding ourselves or nourishing ourselves, although that's important. It's also about making our lives more fun and enjoyable. And it's about experience. Food should be fun. Um, I'm very big on this. Like, I don't understand people who, uh, have so much restrictions in their diets that they're miserable every time they eat. It's a horrible way to live. If you're living that way, I understand if you're trying to avoid certain foods or you're trying to you know, be healthy, but you don't have to be miserable. Make your food make you happy. So I think it's an important message. Yeah. Am I being preachy? <laughs> no, I mean, what's the point in living if you don't eat good food? That's that's our motto. <laughs> it's, it's, yes, it sustains it's, you, but it should also like... Uh, Feed your soul. It's it's arguably one of the greatest pleasures in life. True. And it, you know it's more promising than sex, because you know there's, there's a lot you can do with sex, you know, but it only has so far you can go with it. Food has so much possibility, and I'm surprised every day by. Dang, you got so excited. <laughs> I did. <laughs> Spilt my wine. I haven't even drank any of it yet. Um, yeah. I, anyway, you know what I'm saying. Um. <laughs> So I don't know if anyone has any questions. Um, you might have a question about whether something's edible or not. You can um, you can send texts if you need. Um, there on the um, on the bottom of the screen there there is um, the f um, phone number you can text if you don't if you're not on YouTube and you don't know how to um, you know message through that. Thank you. Um, and uh, and so you can ask any questions about you know if if you were not confused if you're a little confused about how to process something I can answer some questions. I'm sorry I do not know about any mesquite millings. Um, we get that question all the time. Um, everyone's waiting to mill their mesquites, and I'm so sorry. Like I don't know anyone yet. Um, how much were those hammer mills? 
Does anyone want to give us a hundred thousand dollars that we can buy a God, hammer mill? Hundred thousand? Maybe they were like fifty. I I don't know. It, it was like I remember seeing it. It was like that's more expensive than I would pay for a car. Uh. Um, maybe not. I'm cheap when it comes to this stuff. <laughs> so, because then you can't buy as much food. Um. So, somebody asked. Um, let's see. Do you have any references for? Cooking, eating, um, tumbleweed, okay. and uh, blah, 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 blah. Huh. tumbleweed and lamb's quarters. Okay. Um, I looked up, and there's a bunch of, especially lamb's quarters. There's a bunch of. There's recipes. a bunch on lamb's quarters, and there's books about. There's many books with titles like "Eat the Weeds," um, where you can find stuff like this. The more local the author, the more likely you're going to find um, information that's applicable for you. Um, over and over again, in all these classes, you're going to hear this re re repeated. Um, that when you look online, uh, the, the internet is an amazing source of information. And, um, oh, here, let me get off there so I don't, we don't have the forever mirrors. I'm sorry about that. Uh, about that. There we go. <laughs> Um, so, uh, look for the most, there's, there's a lot of old books that, that are out there. I think there's one called Eat the Weeds or something like that. They have a website. Um, Carolyn Neathammer, um, is an author who addresses a lot of these ingredients. I don't know if she addresses eating tumbleweed, but she probably does. Um, I, I actually came across tumbleweed, not from reading a book, but from my knowledge of botany. And, um, it was actually me exploring, I was exploring, um, um, a gratty. I was growing a gratty and okahajiki. Um, and I was reading up on them and I realized that they were in the same genus as tumbleweed. And then I looked up tumbleweed and I realized it was edible, but I didn't find any particular sources myself on that subject. I just started experimenting and I, when I went out, I, I noticed like the seedlings were delicious and that's when I, that's what I gathered the most. And as they got older, they were not as fun to eat. So that's, that's what I know about it. And that's the resource that I had was really just experimentation. But, um, again, experiment, pickle it. That's something that, um, I don't know anybody has done. Um, I'm sure if you YouTube it, maybe somebody has tried to do that, but, um, you still probably want to gather it on the young side when they're big and they're, like that's not going to be an edible thing. You want to get them when they're like this big, and uh, and pickled they're probably really amazing because um, that genus is Salsola. I think they may have changed the genus, but um, that genus uh, pulls salts out of the ground, and that's what influences the flavor of those things, and um, so. Uh, just a delicious food and um, so experiment with pickling with it like uh, you know if you if you've pickled with anything else um, you know what I would do look up how to pickle okahajiki and um, so uh, in Japan okahajiki or land seaweed um, find uh, recipes for that and um, and uh, in, you mimic those flavors and then take it from there um, I don't know if they pickle a gretti in, in Italy. Italy. It's usually just a salad. Yeah, green, it's a right? salad green. It's a fresh green. I think they sometimes cook it. They like like blanch it or something. Yeah, like spinach. Mm. But and maybe flavor it. But like, I, I, but I don't know. I'm not from Italy, so. Um, I mean, I'm sure you could pickle it. Yeah. Oh no, I know you can pickle it. Right. I just don't know if the Italians oh, yeah. did. Um, in terms of finding a reference for. Uh, pickling so anyway uh, again experiment um it was uh it was the um tumbleweed and the oh the lamb's, the lamb's quarters. quarters lamb's quarters are just really just barely cook them you just uh you know again pick them young and if you if you put them on a pan with a little bit of olive oil and just very wilt them just that, that's it don't cook them too long and then eat them and they're they're delicious and you can mix them with vertilagus the purslane um you know, you, there's a lot of these things that kind of come up at the same time. Oh, well, actually, that's not true. Purslane is summer. 
Uh, that's up now, but uh, but there but but uh, the tumbleweed in Kinopodium or, or uh, lamb's quarters is up at the same time. And there's other things like that. So uh, amaranth, no no amaranth is summer too. Yeah yeah. Anyway, um, next question. Um, do we know anyone who currently offers foraging classes in Tucson? I would check out. Uh, John Slattery, what's what's his uh, company? I think he um, doesn't he have classes. I think he might be doing classes at Mission Garden. Mission, that's right, Mission Garden. Um, so Mission Garden is this site where they found the archaeological evidence of the earliest agriculture in the U.S. It's uh, near the base of a mountain there. Um, if you haven't been there, go. It's a really cool. I used to be in the board for Mission Garden. And so there it's, it's close to my heart. Um, it's, uh, it's a garden that's, um, old mission gardens, but it's also the site of, of the indigenous people who were there long before them. Um, and the garden, uh, represents that whole history and prehistory. So, um, so they have different, uh, sections where they have pre-Columbian crops and they have, you know, the Spanish era. They even have the, Chinese um, garden. They have a, a garden for Michael Moore, the famous um, herbalist from our region. Um, so they have very diff various uh, gardens <laughs> in Mission Garden, and it's all histor It's all based on history. Um, so very cool. You should go there anyway. But I think that they. Uh, I think John Slattery, who wrote uh, that Desert Harvesting book that I showed you in the beginning, um, he teaches classes there. So. Um, yeah. So that's what I, yeah. Um, Other I questions? I think that's it. Oh, wait. I don't know. Another question here, it looks like. Maybe. Maybe. Uh, oh. Oh, okay. This is cool. So, uh, somebody said that they use a blend tech blender in, uh, for, in small batches for mesquite flour. And milk as you go. That's someone on here said that too. There, um, Violet Rose says that her mom uses the blend tech. Oh, cool. Yeah. So yeah, so there are ways of doing that, and um, and uh, definitely cheaper than a. It is going to be more work, but it's uh, cheaper than a mill. It's a cheaper than a hammer <laughs> it's mill. It's expensive, but cheaper than a mill. <laughs> <laughs> that is true. Um, yeah, and so you know. Again, you know, we have, there's always new products out there for kitchens. Um, there's always new ways to treat these things where we, we just think of something that was done somewhere else but hasn't been done here and we reapply it to new things. So, like, there, you're always going to find, if you do some experimenting and playing around, you're going to find ways to, um, to make that food. And uh, we're going to look into this because we actually kind of need a, a, a real blender. I know we've been we've been actually talking about this, so <laughs> um, so we'll probably look into that. Um, and again, like uh, making that mesquite syrup is another great way to 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 do that. Yeah, the hammer mill thing. Then it's kind of a bummer, um, but it is successfully blend enough at home, and uh, you know these blenders work. I'm going to look into this because uh, that makes me kind of excited. I I watched some videos on YouTube about this, and at least the videos that I saw, it looked like not only a lot of work for a little bit of food, but it didn't even look like it was very good. And so, um, you know, I, like I, 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 if I'm going to spend that amount of time, I want it to be delicious. And so, um, at least the met methods that I saw in, on YouTube so far, but you know, people are finding stuff out all the time. So, um, anyway, I think uh, that's it. That's it. Cool. Um, Hey, thanks for, hanging out with us um and uh what is the class next week it's uh, container gardening i think um so uh as long as we don't run out of fuel we'll keep doing this um after this batch of classes we may go to every other week it is a lot of work to do this every week <laughs> especially lately it's been a lot of work at the nursery um but uh uh but yeah the um we've had a consistent amount of people attending the classes and so I thank you for uh for doing that and tell your friends about the classes I really 
want to emphasize, especially if you know people who may not have the money and they might feel bad about taking the class and they don't, you know, want to take it without pain. Because pretty much almost everyone, as far as we can tell, almost everyone's pain. So, um, and I'm, thank you for doing that. And it does help because we do spend some time and energy putting these classes together beforehand and, and all that. But, um, but I also want to make sure that there's people out there who, if they don't have um, access to this information, that something like a class fee is keeping them from taking the class. So uh, get the word out there and let people know that these classes are out there. Because I know a lot of people are very interested in the sub these subjects lately, especially. So, um, so yeah. Thanks for uh, hanging out with us and uh, cheers. And um, um, remember that food is, is um, about being happy. And uh, why are you living if you're not enjoying your food? Right? Yeah. <laughs>